Hi, my name is Brian Scassolati. And today I want to talk about some of the challenges of teaching and evaluating social skills using social robots. Now, I'm lucky enough that I've been building social robots for, well, almost 25 years now. And we've built a wide variety of different kinds of systems over the years. And many of these systems, as we've looked at them, we've been able to discern some common ways in which social behavior should be constructed. We have some principles that we follow. We can make bigger eyes to make things more childlike and appealing. We can change the way that a robot is using intonation in order to convey meaning. We can even impact the way that people perceive something as either being an animate agent or an inanimate machine. And as we've discovered many of these different things, we've also come to realize that having these social behaviors is critically important for being able to engage with people, but perhaps more importantly, that we can use these social behaviors as a way of teaching social behavior to people. So I've been working uh, with children with autism spectrum disorder um, for about 20 years. And we've been using robots in different contexts uh, to understand the ways in which we can train social behavior for children who don't acquire it in the same way with the same speed that typically developing children do. Now, over the years, we've learned a lot about this process. We know that robots enhance human-to-human -human interactions, that they speed up the natural learning of social behavior and social contexts, that this is selective for robotics technology and not for other kinds of technologies, not for tablets, not for virtual characters on a screen. We've seen ways that we can predict how and when children will become engaged with these social devices. And we've realized that this engagement is not just a function of novelty. It's not something that wears off. It's not something that's based on just the simplicity or, or the repertoire size of the behavior set of the robot, but rather that there is some fundamental engagement here that uh, still quite escapes us a little bit. We've used these robots to both teach social skills and to do diagnostics, to be able to screen individuals who might be at risk of autism. And we've shown different ways that there are benefits of using this technology. I want to talk for just a few minutes about some of the most recent findings that we've seen in this domain. And most of this stems from uh, a 2018 study where for the first time, we put social robots into homes with a family, with a child with autism, and tried to use that system as a long-term social training mechanism. That is not just to look at one short interaction to see whether or not we could achieve social engagement, and not just to see whether we could see some uh, sort of uh, anecdotal change over a course of a few exposures in the lab in a well-controlled study, but rather to see whether we could do this on a larger scale in the complex environment of the home and without the benefit of having someone teleoperating or remotely controlling the robot itself. So our technological uh, requirements for this system were quite complex. We wanted to be able to have a system that was autonomous, that would be able to have the right curricula so that it could adapt and change to the specific needs of each individual child. And that it could do this over a course of weeks and months and not just with a sort of one, two, three shot exposure that most systems at the time were doing. So we designed a system uh, using a Jibo robot that we placed into 20 homes for kids with autism. And with these systems, uh, the robot played a role that was somewhere between uh, a uh, sort of game master moderator and a, a, another player. That is, it did many of the same things that a therapist would do if a therapist were sitting there in the home with the family. That is, sometimes they would engage in the game itself, sometimes they would just help moderate the game and engage the child and one of the adult caregivers.
So the robot's role here is not just to teach, not just to sort of impart material as you would in a lecture or in a recording like this, but rather to try to get the right kind of engagement with an individual such that you could keep the interaction going, such that you could moderate the way that that child was interacting with their parent and hopefully enhance that interaction. Because the goal here, while the interactions were always between the robot, the child, and the parent, the goal was never to increase the sort of quality of the interaction between the robot and the child, but rather to focus on the quality of the interaction between the child and the parent. So the robot here would play a series of social games, again, ones that we drew directly from what therapists were using in these uh, same sorts of training sessions. And these games focused on different social skills that we wanted the children to be able to pick up. Uh, we focused on tasks like understanding emotions when we told short stories or being able to make and maintain joint attention on a target uh, with your parent. Uh, skill, skills like turn taking and perspective taking, being able to see what someone else was seeing and take their point of view. And with each of these games, we designed them to be able to operate at a multiple different sort of scale of uh, difficulty and also to ramp in difficulty as the child was more and more capable. Um, we operated these systems uh, autonomously for 30 days in probably what is one of the most complex environments that we as roboticists like to deal with. Um, honestly, I would rather design software for a Mars rover than for a system to work in the home, because at least most things on the surface of Mars are predictable within a range. But when you get into that home setting, everything goes out the window. Everything changes all of the time, and there's very little regularity that you can rely upon. So even in these complex environments, um, we were able to maintain 30 days without contact with the research team um, to build an adaptive system so that each and every one of these systems was doing something different depending upon the strengths of that child, the preferences of that child, and what they responded to most as the interaction went on. To do it in that complex environment, and most importantly, to evaluate this system using generalizable metrics that is not just to look at what we knew we could achieve, but to try to get a really high bar for the kinds of expectations that we would have for these systems. Now, that's not to say that we didn't test the simple things as well. So for example, we tracked how well the children were doing in each of the games. And sure enough, those game skills and the sort of scoring that they had in these games ramped up over the course of the month for all of the children in all of the games. We also looked at another easy metric. We looked at what the parents thought was happening. And we knew that this was a subjective measure that they might be just uh, telling us what we wanted to hear, or they might be wishful thinking about the uh, improvements of their child. But still, we consider that to be one additional metric. And in fact, the parents told us that over the course of the month, the children started making more eye contact. They initiated conversations more often. They responded to communication bids from the parents or from others in the family more often. And each of these metrics was robust over the population that we studied. Perhaps most importantly though, we asked an outside clinical team to come and evaluate the children in our study using the same kinds of diagnostic metrics that they would use in the clinic, but here delivered in the home on a set of uh, individual visits. That is, we tested the children 30 days before our robot trial started. On the day that the robot trial started, that's day zero for us, 30 days into the trial, that is the last day the robot was present, and then 30 days after the robot had been taken away. So here we were looking first at the comparison between 30 days before and the first day that the robot was on site to see whether or not children were just learning on their own, whether they were learning through just maturation or through any of the other programs that they were involved with 
in their school or their other therapy. And in fact, none of our kids made any significant gains over the initial 30 days. In 30 days with the robot though, almost all of our children showed a significant improvement, all showed some kind of an improvement. And statistically, we saw a marked increase in a number of different social skills, including things like joint attention, skills that we were directly training. Now, those skills, that gain that we saw, disappeared 30 days after the robot was taken away. That is, the children improved for 30 days while the robot was there, but then once the robot was taken away, once they were no longer receiving that therapy, their skills started to degrade. Now, this sounds at first as if it's bad news, but in fact, it's actually good news for us. It tells us that this intervention is the thing that's actually being successful here. This is called an ABA design in most medical uh, settings. That is, we apply no treatment, apply the treatment, and then remove the treatment and see if the result goes away. We weren't expecting any of the children to actually learn this skill permanently in 30 days. Um, if it were, then we could go out, give all these kids 30 days of sort of boot camp training and they would be cured. And we can't do that with the best known human delivered therapies. We didn't expect this from the robot at all. So this was in fact exactly the kind of result that we were looking for and hoping for to show that this system was actually having an impact on these children. And if we were able to maintain this, not just for 30 days, but for six months, a year, two years, that we would hope to see and expect to see some more significant long-term gains. Now, uh, this is what you can see on paper. Um, but in fact, I think the story is richer than that even, in that when we go and we talk to the parents, we talk to the families, um, they are overjoyed with this kind of social engagement, um, in part because they, it's just easy to do. The kids are excited about it. And one of the things that's really difficult with behavioral therapies is to just keep doing it day after day after day. And if the robot makes that fun, the families are all for it. But I think even more than that, the robots were really striking a particular chord for these children. Now, let me not try to explain that myself, but rather let one of the parents from the study uh, explain it in her words. Um, we asked the parents to just record something about what they thought at the end of the protocol. Um, and here's what one of the mothers had to say. Um, sometimes the th therapies are, they get a little exhausting and he's not excited and this one wasn't like that. He was, he was ready to play at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> that um, we went to the, to the playground one day and I noticed immediately he, there was a group of children playing um, in the sand and he walked up to them and said, hi, you know, what are you doing? And I don't think he would have done that a month ago. So that kind of behavioral transfer is exactly the kind of thing that we're hoping to see, that we want to see that the skills that we're practicing here are being utilized in other contexts with other adults, with other kids, when the robot is not around. And that's the highest bar that we can really be setting. Okay. So we've been working with social skills training for kids with autism for years and years now. Many groups are doing it and we're making improvements. We're making advances all the time. But I wanna change gears for just a second and show that the social skills training for kids with ASD is not the only frontier that we should be thinking about. And I wanna expand that first just a little and then I wanna expand it a lot. So to take sort of one step larger we could think about not just children with autism, but what about adults with autism? There are lots of social skills there that are new to the adult world that these individuals have to then begin to deal with. And in fact, this is a major problem because in many places like the US, a lot of our social services are designed to work for children. And once you hit the age of 18, suddenly they all disappear. But here we have adults who still are in need in some way, and they are often being asked to suddenly do social uh, tasks that they've never had experience with before. How do you 
do a job interview? How do you get along with a coworker? How do you navigate a social relationship with an employer? These are things that well, many 18 year olds struggle with. And you can imagine the impact it is for an 18 year old with autism. Every year in the US, we have 70,000 children with autism who become adults with autism and who start seeking employment. And almost 80% of them will experience some sort of chronic underemployment or unemployment. So what are the social skills that we could be trying to, treat, to, trying to teach at this level? Well, one of the major things that uh, my group has been looking at is the ability to deal with uh, social interruptions in the workplace. So we all have this experience, or we used to before the pandemic. You'd be sitting in your office, you'd be working, or you'd be having a meeting, and someone knocks on the door, or the phone rings, or someone texts you. And there's that momentary interruption. It derails your thoughts, it changes what you're doing, and then you have to get back to where you were. For an adult with autism, this can be a particularly difficult task. Uh, Aaron Likens, who's one of the autism ambassadors for Easter Seals, he puts it like this. He says, that's the way my brain is. Once at speed, I can focus with perfect clarity, but that one interruption can bring about a complete change in ability to focus or achieve a task. Hence why the unsuspecting interrupter is going to get what sounds like an angry answer. These interruptions, they happen not just once or twice, they are pervasive. And while for most typically developing adults, we might see that interruption as a minor inconvenience, for an adult with autism, that could signal a five to 15 to 20 minute or 30 minute derailment from their task. And in fact, when we survey adults with autism, they tell us that interruptions might might impact them by about five minutes. But when we ask their employers, their employers tell us that it's more like 20 minutes. So here's one where even the perception of what's happening is very different between the adult employee and the employer. And that by itself is a problem. Now, these interruptions are pervasive. They happen in across all types of jobs and across all types of time periods. Even if you're doing something like stocking grocery store, store shelves, you'll have customers come up and interrupt you. Where can I find this? Where can I find that? Even if you're sitting alone in a call center or doing data entry or labeling training data for an AI system, you'll have coworkers interrupt you. Can you cover my shift? Are you done with that file yet? Are you ready for this next task? Or even working outside in a mostly solo job. You'll have your employer, your boss coming and saying, can you do this instead? Well, I want you to do this. Have you done this task yet? And those social interruptions can be extremely challenging. So what do we do about it? Well, we've been taking the same approach. That is, we've been trying to produce an in-home training system, a prototype system that will allow us to do rapid testing, and potentially rapid commercialization if it is something that's successful. We take again a Jibo robot, we wrap it with a couple of additional sensors, put it together into a small package, and we place it in the home of an adult with autism. Where the idea here is that this robot will actively interrupt the user. This is one of the reasons why it has to be a real robot. Just having something on a screen isn't compelling in the same way that it will actively interrupt the user at random periods of time when they've been able to say that they are available and that they'll be able to practice this skill. That is, a, a typical scenario might be that the user is engaged in doing something. Maybe they're watching TV or cooking dinner or working on their computer and the robot will suddenly interrupt with a typical workplace interruption. You know, what time is the meeting today? And our user will have to give a response and then begin to refocus back on what they were doing before. 
Now, we had planned to do this pre-COVID, and we had a little bit of a delay in getting this out there, but we spent a little extra time packaging this up so that we could not only actually do data collection during COVID, but actually use a complete drop-off based system. So there was no human contact. That is, we basically show up at someone's door, leave a robot on their doorstep, ring their doorbell and walk away. And the system is simple enough that they can take it in, plug it in and get up and running and get it started all by themselves. When the system is running, it will, during the preset time periods that the user specifies, do between two and five short little interruptions each hour. Here's what one of these interruptions might look like. Hey, Emmanuel, are you done with the Peters in the town yet? Um, no, I will get it done by tomorrow morning. Great. Email me when it's done. Certainly will. And once the interruption is done, the robot goes back to a passive sleep mode. But all the time we're recording how well the user is doing in resuming their original task. Now, there's a lot about this that we don't know. Will practice by itself be enough to make someone more resilient to dealing with interruptions? Will training in one of these domains be able to be transferable to another domain? Is there a better way of training someone to deal with interruptions? Should you start with less frequent, shorter interruptions and then work your way up to more frequent ones? Is the type of interruption critical if it is social or non-social? And so we've been trying to look at ways in which we can understand this because dealing with interruptions is actually one of the unique social skills that we've had actually very little study of. Even in other domains for neurotypical adults, we don't know very much about how to train people to deal with cognitive interruptions. If we did, we would be using this kind of training with people ranging from, well, airline traffic controllers to surgeons. So much of what we learn with these applications well, here we're focused on adults with autism because there is a real critical need there. This is something that generalizes to a much larger question. Um, we'll be running a study this summer to see, in fact, to answer a few of these small questions. So for example, if I train you to uh, deal with one type of interruption, and then I start interrupting you more frequently with another type of interruption, does your training with the first type carry over to the second type? Does it carry over if I have you start a new task? That is, if you've been working on Tower of Hanoi problems and I've been interrupting you with a Stroop-based color matching task, if I switch to a mathematics task, do you maintain your resilience? What if I switch your original task from Towers of Hanoi to a memory-based task? will you still be able to deal with interruptions in this way? Okay, let me get to my third and final point here. While we've talked a lot about building social behavior and we're gonna have a whole day of talking about social interaction and social behavior in these systems, I wanna make a plea for us as a community to stop using really brittle evaluations. Now, let me tell you a little bit of what I mean by that. We often think about trying to build a particular system, some little subsystem, some little module that we can put into our robot that will do one thing for us. We're engineers, that's what we do. But when we think about evaluating that small module, we often try to isolate its performance from everything else, test it in a way that we can just see how well that by itself is doing. And while that's the right thing for us to do when a field is young and, and sort of, uh, when that's the only way in which we can evaluate systems, I think we as a field have come to a point where we should be thinking bigger. Let me give you a, an example of that. So, one of the things that's been studied since the 
long before the, even the beginning of really social interaction. And that's learning from demonstration. That is, we have some human expert who knows some skill, who teaches it to some robot. And we call this behavior, this performance, social learning. And when we evaluate it, we might have a, a benchmark, a set of suite that we can test it on that everybody else can use. Can you pick up these things from this particular database? Can you replicate this particular set of performances? Or sometimes it's just based on the behavioral fidelity. How close to a perfect tennis swing do you really get? And in fact, when we publish these things, we tend to publish them in, well, robotics-oriented places, IROS, ICRA, CORAL. And really what we're thinking about when we're thinking about this, this process, this learning process for the robot, we're really talking about transferring this knowledge between a human and a machine. Now, at the same time, we have this whole other separate community one that focuses on robots that teach things to people. And we call this intelligent tutoring systems. We give it a whole new name. And here we worry about things like the performance of the student, the novice, the human that's being taught here. We test them with subject-based testing. How many state capitals can you name? How well can you perform on these mathematics tests or these physics questions? And we measure how much you gain between before the intervention and after the intervention. And we publish these things here in a completely different set of conferences. Most of them go to places like AAAI or HCI or ITS. But again, here we're talking about transferring knowledge, this understanding, but only this time it's going from the robot to the person. Now, even in the last five years, we've seen kind of a, a middle ground in this world. We've seen this sort of collaborative sort of concept come about in names like collaborative manufacturing, co-robots, pick your favorite NSF-based uh, abbreviation here. Where here we've got information that goes back and forth. Sometimes it goes one way, sometimes it goes the other. But we don't really have great evaluation metrics here. We're just starting to understand them. Sometimes we talk about, well, maybe it's based on the workload. We'll use something like NASA's TLX measure to say, does this make it easier for the human? Does this collaboration make their task any easier? Or, or some sort of speed up of, are they faster at doing this task together than they were separately? And we publish these things in places like HRI and Roma. But there's a commonality here. And even though we sort of segment off and silo these things in different directions, I wanna make the case that we shouldn't be. That we should in fact recognize that this is all part of one bigger process. This process of taking knowledge or information or understanding and passing it back and forth from one agent to another. That is, wouldn't it be better if instead of all of these separate things, if we could build complete systems that were able to learn something and then collaborate on that task with someone and then teach it to someone new? Wouldn't that be a better way of measuring what a robot really knew and really understood? It's sort of like the old adage, you don't really understand it until you can teach it. In fact, this is such a familiar idea that it keeps coming up over and over again, sometimes with different names. If you go to med school, they talk about see one, do one, teach one. That is, you're not qualified to do a particular procedure until you've observed it, someone else do it, collaborated and done it with someone else, and then taught the process to another person. In early childhood education, we give it a name that comes from the German, German uh, Lernen durch Lernen, learning through teaching. Where we have students teach material as a way of increasing their mastery of the material, of demonstrating that they really do understand it. In the ITS world, 
we call it reciprocal peer tutoring. That is the idea that being able to go back and forth really does show your mastery of that material. So when we talk about social behavior, not just social learning, but social behavior as a whole, can we do this kind of work where we're not testing the small individual piece, but we're trying to see it as part of the larger whole? Now, that of course comes with costs and benefits. We get more complex and comprehensive evaluation metrics. And we get systems that can sort of flexibly move from teacher to student to collaborator. And when we have systems that can do that, that means that we can separate the person who knows the information and the person who's going to learn it eventually across time and space. And especially during a pandemic, that's really kind of important. But there are costs. When you learn something in the system, you need to have a system, a model that is explainable. We can't use these completely opaque, or sorry, completely opaque uh, deep learning models where we can't explain what we've learned. We have the problem that we've got to build this complex system that's bigger and does more things all at once in order to get to the point of evaluating something. Can't I just evaluate my own little model? And because we have to do that whole cycle, it could limit the scope of the problem that we're able to deal with. I'm not saying that we need to do this all the time, but some of the time we should be doing this. To see a behavior, not just for can we do this correctly, not just can I make eye contact, but can I use that effectively in context to achieve some goal, some bigger goal? I'll give one quick example. A few of my students did this for an HRI paper last year, where they tried to take a human who knew music theory and teach a robot about harmony, and then have the robot teach that same concept to another human, a novice, who knew nothing about music theory. And just to jump into what's always the fun part of the video, here's the robot learning about what series of notes can form a harmony? My name is Alex. I'm really excited to get to learn today. What skill will I be learning today? Uh, harmony. Thanks for showing me that. And when the human demonstrates and the robot questions and the human, learn, or the human demonstrates again, the robot's able to come up with a concept of what that means. And here it's a simple concept, it's just what are the relationships between these series of notes? But then they can turn around and with another expert again, collaborate with that expert, complete the harmony, harmonize with How that person. Should I play? One. Okay, I'm listening for you to play the first two keys. Thanks for showing me that. Thanks for showing me that. Was that correct? Yes. And while this is sequential, it's not quite what we would love for a, from a point of view of actually making music, it does demonstrate that the robot knows what it's doing so that then when we bring in a novice, someone who knows nothing about it, the robot can turn around and teach that concept to the novice. The first key can be anything. The second key should be the first key plus one. The third key should be the second key plus three. Yes, that's right. Awesome. That's great. Wait for me to play one note and then play what the next two notes would be for a Foxwoods harmony. Yes, that's right. Awesome. That's great. So it's a simple example, but it's still my plea for us all. All right, so what are the messages I wanted to leave you with today? There's still many, many frontiers of social behavior that we're going to be working on. They're all exciting and new for us. That social behavior is a skill for both robots and people and studying both is essential. 
social skills training is not just for kids and not just for kids with uh, ASD. And finally, the evaluation of social skills should move beyond these siloed structures to a more complete understanding. Thanks very much, and I'll be happy to take some questions.